Goodnight, Mr. Tom by Michelle Magorian. Yes, said Tom bluntly on opening the front door. What do you want? A harassed middle-aged woman in a green coat and felt hat stood on his step. He glanced at the armband on her sleeve. She gave him an awkward smile. I'm the billeting officer for this area, she began. Oh yes, and what's that got to do with me? She flushed slightly. Well, Mr. Mr. Um, Oakley, Thomas Oakley. Oh, thank you, Mr. Oakley. She paused and took a deep breath. Mr. Oakley, with the declaration of war imminent, Tom waved his hand. I knows all that. Get to the point. What do you want? He noticed a small boy at her side. It's him I've come about, she said. I'm on my way to your village hall with the others. What others? She stepped to one side. Behind the large iron gate which stood at the end of the graveyard were a small group of children. Many of them were filthy and very poorly clad. Only a handful had a blazer or coat. They all looked bewildered and exhausted. One tiny dark haired girl in the front was hanging firmly onto a new teddy bear. The woman touched the boy at her side and pushed him forward. It's no need to tell me, said Tom. It's obligatory and it's for the war effort. You're entitled to choose your child, I know, began the woman apologetically. Tom gave a snort. But his mother wants him to be with someone who's religious or near a church. She was quite adamant, said she would only let him be evacuated if he was. Was what? asked Tom impatiently. Near a church. Tom took a second look at the child. The boy was thin and sickly looking, pale with limp sandy hair and dull grey eyes. His name's Willie, said the woman. Willie, who had been staring at the ground, looked up. Round his neck, hanging from a piece of string, was a cardboard label. It read, William Beach. Tom was well into his sixties. A healthy, robust, stockily built man with a head of thick white hair. Although he was of average height, in Willie's eyes he was a towering giant with skin like coarse, wrinkled brown paper and a voice like thunder. He glared at Willie. You'd best come in, he said abruptly. The woman gave a relieved smile. Thank you so much, she said, as she backed quickly away and hurried down the tiny path towards the other children. Willie watched her go. Come on in, repeated Tom harshly. I ain't got all day. Nervously, Willie followed him into a dark hallway. It took a few seconds for his eyes to adjust from the brilliant sunshine he had left to the comparative darkness of the cottage. He could just make out the shapes of a few coats hanging on some wooden pegs and two pairs of boots standing below. Suppose you best know where to put your things, muttered Tom, looking up at the coat rack and then down at Willie. He scratched his head. It eye for you. I'd better put it on a low peg. He opened a door on his left and walked into the front room, leaving Willie in the hallway still clutching onto his brown carrier bag. Through the half-open door, he could see a large black cooking range with a fire in it and an old threadbare armchair nearby. He shivered. Presently, Tom came out with a pencil. You can put that old bag down, he said gruffly. You ain't going no place else. Willie did so and Tom handed him the pencil. He stared blankly up at him. Go on, said Tom. I told you before, I ain't got all day. Now make a mark so I know where to put a peg, see? Willie made a faint dot on the wall beside the hem of one of the large coats. Make a nice big one so as I can see it clear, like. Willie drew a sm small circle and filled it in. Tom leaned down and peered at it. Neat little chap, ain't you? Give me your Macintosh and I'll put it on top of mine for now. With shaking fingers, Willie undid his belt and buttons, peeled off the Macintosh and held it in his arms. Tom took it from him and hung it on top of his great coat. He walked back into the front room. Come on, he said. Willie followed him in.